What's up, guys? Calendar says February, so we've talked to Nick Saban already. Check it off the box. We talked to Jimbo Fisher. We talked to Mario Cristobal in the last couple of weeks, but Paul White's in town. AEW's <laughs> in town. So why in the world on this college football show would we waste time on college football when we can just shake hands, a sizable hand himself here, <laughs> Paul White's in the house. Um, well, thank you very, very much for having me. That's such an incredible list of uh, historic coaches that you named, and now I'm so happy to be a part of this. I'm a little humbled. Humble. I didn't expect the H word to come out of your mouth so so suddenly. Oh, I have all kinds of words that come out of my mouth. Just yeah. hold on. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's, it's so a... luckily we're recording this. <laughs> you guys are in town. AEW's here. Right. It feels like a carnival. I live downtown. You guys are working municipal auditorium, right. which there are a ton of great old school stories about across the territory days and whatnot. Wow. But now AEW's running that building. Yeah, it, it's such a cool building to run. It's got so much history, and you know that's the thing that I'm so proud to be a part of with AEW is uh, it's a Alternative to to what we've seen for so many years with with other products that are so uh, cr so commercialized, so produced, uh, cookie cut, stamped, uh, insert wrestler here. Whereas AEW, it's much more gets back to the roots of, of wrestling, and it's about the talent in the ring, and and telling the stories in the ring with a lot less soap opera. It's really, really interesting. A lot of terms that were used there that maybe if you just watch college football and you watch the show, he just said produce. Like, well, I use the word produced all the time. What does right. that mean? Well, in the wrestling world, you know, for someone who just broad strokes it, wrestling is wrestling, it's not. No. And you just mentioned that there's a version, obviously, up in Connecticut that is very much produced and packaged. Yeah, it's definitely packaged. Just with the graphic packages and just like, you know, when you have your NFL Sunday or college football Saturdays when they cut to the different graphics in the package. Sure, they have all that. It's a, it's a, it's a very well-produced product. But what AEW, and we're just starting out, we're just a couple years old, uh, we've already... Uh, kicking the big company in Connecticut. We've already kicked their buck in our ratings head-to-head -head battles on Wednesday nights. We've dominated that with our Dynamite show. Uh, we're doing very well with Rampage now. So it's growing, but it's an alternative for fans that want to get back to the roots of wrestling, that want to get back to professional wrestling and not sports entertainment. And that's, that's the great alternative. And one of the things that attracted me to AEW was that authenticity. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because we do a college football show here, and yet in our free time, all we do is talk about wrestling. That's all we do. <laughs> we will go on. Well, it's funny. You walk into a wrestling <laughs> locker room, all they're talking about yeah. is football. So there you go. So it's a natural <laughs> marriage. But I remember, you know, when I first got hooked, I'm like the classic prototype okay. for the 18 to 49 male that got hooked in the late 90s. Right. And so I pretty much have watched your entire career. Thanks. When you got big figuratively of course, figurative, yeah. is when I would have come to the TV. Pretty much at birth, I, my mom exploded, but oh, you mean when I got on Which TV. I want to come back to, because that right. whole story is fascinating. <laughs> but like, I remember one of the hallmarks back in uh, late 90s, early 2000s wrestling even, would be if I turn the TV on and I would watch a guy go in, occasionally he'd trip over a sentence, occasionally he'd repeat himself, and what that said to someone who expected a soap opera is, oh, he screwed up. What it said to me is, wow, that's not scripted. He's just kind of saying whatever he wants to say, and, uh, Paul, I don't turn the TV on and see that a whole lot anymore in certain places. How has that changed? Well, it's changed a lot. Like, well, where I came from for so many years, um, there was a staff of 25 or 30 writers backstage. And I think the responsibility that company was adhering to is because they had so many sponsors and business partnerships that they were trying to create. And this was an empire that was driven by sports entertainment. And they had a structured way of they, where they wanted promos done. They wanted certain characters to say certain things in a certain way. So it was very uh, soap opera produced. Whereas in AEW, uh, if you have a promo, <laughs> you have a promo. <laughs> so it's funny, like when I first started in WCW, the, the, I didn't have writers and all that stuff. So a lot of the promos were me trying to find my way and, and learning how to promo. And then when I went to WWE, a lot of that was comforting because, yeah, I learned how to get over and build a relationship and learn how to be a better storyteller because everything was kind of programmed out for me. But now that I'm older and a lot experienced, seasoned, yeah. I think is a good word, seasoned. Yeah. Can we use season? Seasoned citizen, if you will. Yeah. Seasoned sounds good. Um, I really like the old school approach of letting the talent just identify themselves and make that connection with the audience because that's what is important is making that connection with the audience. If you watch AEW and you see our current top bad guy or heel as we call him our business with, with MJF, he's amazing. 
You know, and here's a kid that he has that innate old school ability to make you just loathe him and hate him. And uh, that kind of character and that kind of authenticity really comes through in our product. You are one of still a very, very small group of people who can honestly say, I've worked with Vince McMahon, I've worked with Tony Khan. <laughs> yeah. And so I know you probably I worked get, with Bischoff, I've yeah. worked with Vince, and, and now I get the opportunity to work with Tony. I've had a crazy career. I started in 95, and I pretty much in the past four decades have wrestled and competed with, worked with everyone that's ever been anyone in this industry. From guys that, that really put wrestling on the map in the 80s with Hogan and Savage and, and Ric Flair and Arn Anderson and Sting and all those incredible talents, Ricky the Dragon, Steamboat, uh, all these incredible legends that I grew up watching. And then in the 90s, you know, I got to work with you know, Goldberg and, and all the talents in WCW, Kevin Nash and Scott Hall, and then go to WWE and the whole run from Stone Cold to The Rock to Mick Foley to all those guys. Those were guys, you know, that I got to learn from Undertaker, who was a huge influence in my career for a long time. Um, to work with a crop of talent that we have now that's incredible talent from, you know, Hangman Adam Page and, and you've got um, John Moxley and, and Brian Danielson. Um, just it's so incredible to see the scope of talent that I've been fortunate enough to work with. I've always wondered when you look at a, a wrestling locker room right. versus, let's say, a football locker room, right. you got individual goals, you got collective goals. Right. Do you view the wrestling business as an individual sport or a team sport? Um, that's great, great question, actually. It's interesting because as individual as it is, because it's your responsibility to go out there and present a character that basically, bottom line, uh, makes a connection with the audience and puts butts in seats. That's your goal. You are selling yourself as a, as an athlete, as an entertainer, as a, as, as someone that someone sees your name on the card. They want to buy a ticket and watch you. So it's very individual that way. But at the same time, the entire scope of the card, of everyone on that card, is designed for something for everyone. So there's a real team energy on how do we do on ratings? How do we do on selling tickets for the house? Like. How are our fans uh, happy with the product that we're putting out? Because we're very uh, engaged socially with our fans to try to keep that product fresh and new and, and keep them guessing and keep them excited, excited so that they turn in, tune in every week. But though it's an individual sport, it is very much a good synergy team sport. Because everybody, you know, there's a real famous guy named Dwayne Johnson who's saying, know your role. And that comes from a locker room thing that everyone does have a role in the locker room. Not everybody is going to be you know, the top star like CM Punk. Not everybody's going to be that guy, you know. So you need to find out where you are, where you are going, and hopefully one day become that guy, but work towards being that top guy, but filling in in between and making the entire show better. If that makes any sense. I know it was long-winded, no, but... it was great. It's philosophical, but it was a, too. Yeah, but it's a great question because it's frustrating for a lot of younger talent because a lot of younger talent come right out of wrestling school and say, I want to be the next CM Punk or I want to be the next John Cena. Well hold on, you're talking out of all the billions of people on this planet in wrestling, out of the different companies that have wrestling on TV, you maybe have, what, a little over 120, 130 people a week that people see every week on TV. It's a real small percentage. Now, out of that small percentage, there's even a smaller percentage that achieve that superstar level that guys like Rock and Stone Cold and, and John Cena and CM Punk and all those guys have, have achieved. So... Set your goals, but also be realistic. Are you here to make a career for a 20 year career, or are you here to flash and burn out in three or four years? So, what's you a, know. What's amazing, too, I don't think a lot of people are familiar with like the pay structure. <laughs> I, I just don't think a lot of people are familiar with it. And I know that's changed even in your it, industry, but could you, could you go back, like, go back late 90s, or you came in the WW at that time, right. F. At an incredible time, right? Uh, that anniversary just passed very recently. But yeah, Valentine's Day Massacre. Yeah, at, at what is now a Bass Pro Shop. <laughs> right <laughs> there you go. But, but could you look at your paycheck back then and see that because Steve Austin is doing what he's doing, there's yes. a bigger number on my paycheck. Yes, and it's in my best interest for that guy to fly as high as he can too. Prime prime example. My first year in WWF, um, I worked very few main events, a couple here and there. I worked mostly. Uh, I want to say mid-card matches, um, 
uh, nothing at the top guy level. But, you know, in wrestling, if you're lucky, you have a contract, you have a guaranteed contract, but you start off in the hole. So the way the pay structure is done, you start off in the hole and then you work as many times as you can to build that up. And then eventually, once you work past that guarantee, then extra stuff comes in. Hard to explain, but that's just, that was the system back then. But I had no idea when I first started in the Attitude Era, and it was so hot back then, that a guy like Stone Cold being on top, even though I didn't work main events, I still did incredibly 60, 70% better uh, than years later with him not being on the card or, you know, some of the other guys weren't. It wasn't until John Cena came along for me that, you know, I saw that that uh, basically business picked up again. That's the same we have in this business. Like they used to call Hulk Hogan the golden goose because back in the day when Hulk Hogan was on a card, everything sold out, everybody made money. Uh, Paul Orndorff. Um, Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff talked about having a chance to work with Hulk Hogan was like, you know, one of the best years he ever had in his career financially because he got to work with a guy that helped pull the people in, you know, and that's how the business has run for years. That's why I, when I say it's more of a team effort and know your role, know who you're supporting. And the business has changed too because for a lot of times, you know, it was always a male-dominated draw. Yeah. Now, um, you have... Uh, your female athletes, your female competitors that are drawing and getting better reactions than a lot of the guys. You know, when you see, you know, we have an, uh, an, a tremendous women's division at AEW with Dr. Britt Baker and, and Jade Cargill who are just tremendous athletes, tremendous spokeswomen for the company. And, uh, you know, when you see them going, people are generally excited. It's not the old school um, uh, just to have a chick out there in a bikini top because she's hot. No, these girls are athletes and they compete and, you know, they put butts in seats. So they deserve the respect. So you guys, we're, we're recording this on a Wednesday. You right. got you got Dynamite tonight. Yeah. You got Rampage that airs now on Fridays. You got TBS on Wednesday, TNT on Fridays. What has the travel been like modern day compared to the schedule that you were working at the peak of what your travel schedule would have been? Well, my peak travel schedule, I was working... Uh, back in the day, I was probably working. I would go out on Friday and work Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, home, Wednesday afternoon, Thursday, back out Friday morning. And I did that for 18 years. I went 19 years, I think, and never missed an overseas tour. Now, I want to stop you right there and ask you, because I've heard people talk about how Andre the Giant was treated right. back in the day and how he was booked, right. especially in the latter portion of his career right. when he was viewed as an attraction. And right. you didn't want to oversaturate. He was, he was always an attraction. And, and funny, Andre would book himself. Because like sometimes back in the day, WF would do what they call two-a-days on the weekends. Yeah. Uh, show at 1 o'clock and then show at 7 o'clock in a different city. And Andre would go to both towns, but he'd only work once. Yeah. <laughs> and I would say, no, I work once today. Once. You pick. I work Boston. I work New York. You pick. You know, and that was his thing because he understood his value. And things were different back then, you know, as... As protected as talent is now with contracts and making sure that they're, you know, they're going to get paid and, and whatnot. Uh, back in the day, there wasn't as much security other than your ability to draw and your ability to, to be a business person. And that's why Andre, they always called Andre the boss, is because Andre knew his value, knew he was a draw, knew he was the eighth wonder of the world, and pretty much called the shots. And there was nothing that you could do back then. I mean, now, sure, they could tie him up in litigation. And, yeah. you know, it's just a different world now. As, as much as a business has evolved, um, some of the old school things, the legendary stories that Andre got away with, you're, you know, it wouldn't happen now. Uh, you know, Andre would get on a plane and he'd have his first class seat. And he believed that the overhead above his seat was for his bag. <laughs> and if he looked up and saw a bag above his seat, he would take the bag out and drop it on the floor and put his briefcase in there. And then you would see some business guy try to <laughs> sneak up and pull his bag out. Now there'd be a video of it and, you know, Andre would be hated and would be a bully and, you know, so just different times. You, um, you guys came in this morning and I've always been fascinated with buildings. 
I've always been fascinated with stories about travel and whatnot. I mean, you were you were telling me about Amarillo, and you're telling yeah. me about all these all these different towns that, quite frankly, we could do like a five hour special on. Probably, and somebody would probably die of boredom. But, <laughs> but, you, but you go to you. So you've been in the game plenty long enough now, where you go to every city. Yeah. You got a story about every city. You got a place you stay. You got a place you eat. You've got stories about that arena. Mm -hmm. And so, like when you come to Nashville, for example, mm -hmm. what comes to mind when I say Paul White career Nashville, Tennessee? Um, it's funny, I used to, for, when I think of Nashville, Tennessee, and this is just a personal thing, so um, for years on the road, right around 2004, I started leasing a tour bus. So for years, I leased a tour bus from uh, a Music City coach um, here in, uh, in Nashville, and then I ended up going over to, to All Access coach. So I had my own tour bus on the road, because it made more sense for me traveling, because we were on the road so much in so many days, and usually every you would wrestle in one city, and then 250 miles later, be in another city, and you would you would work a loop. For me, folding up in a rental car every night for you know four or five hours, or trying to find a hotel with a big enough shower, a big enough bed, and I, I ended up doing the rock star thing, or the country music singer thing. I got my own tour bus, I had my own dressing room, my clothes. All I had to go through the airports was my wallet. I didn't have to carry a bag, and that made life. I think that extended my career and it was an investment in myself. You know, when I first started doing it, a lot of the guys gave me a lot of crap, like, you know, I was trying to be a big baller. Then after they saw the um, benefits. They put the thumb up. They said, they, can I ride along? Well, they, they got their own buses. Yeah. I, remember, I remember having the first bus in WWE, then all of a sudden, like, you know, there was like, I pulled up one day, there was like nine buses there. <laughs> I was like, you know, then I went to the, I went to the bus guys, hey man, can I get like a break for bringing you all this business? You know, and actually got me a good break. So. Hi, referral fee. Hey, I got a referral free, I sure did. So thank you, Eric, you're a good man at All Very Access. Nice. So, I mean, when I think about what we do, and mm -hmm. I think about going to college football games every Saturday, right. that's like the pinnacle of, of my career. I, that's what I love. I can't right. believe they pay me to do it. Right. You get to do what you love to do for right. a living. I was talking with some of the guys before you and I walked in the studio about what this device, what a cell phone has done to both of those live experiences mm -hmm. and what it would have been like even just 15 years ago when no one was worried about taking a picture on a phone or taking video on a phone versus what it's like when you watch a live event now and someone's music hits and everyone's phone goes up. Yeah. I'm really interested from your perspective in the ring have you noticed a difference in the live experience pre and post cell phone? Definitely, I think the audience is more informed. Um, I remember, you know, it was very hard, I think, back in the day, especially when you had guys work in local territories or work in local TV stations. Um, the ability to reach a bigger audience has always been a struggle for any, any growth in, in entertainment with apps and with cell phones, um, social media, it's made it so that the fans can interact, be passionate, and be more involved uh, with, the, with the characters that they want to follow, from um, people showing up events and knowing everyone's ring music or knowing everyone's catchphrases because they have access to information. You know, it's the same thing with football. How many football statisticians do you see running around now because of like back in the day if there were one or two guys that you knew that really knew football that knew coaching that knew plays offense defense ins outs players you know they were like savants now a guy can pick up a phone and be a savant in 10 seconds you know so yes on one hand it's made it uh with a cell phone it's made it for a better interaction and it's better for the fan to make a connection uh, on the other hand, uh, it's uh, some of the hardcore dedicated fans that you used to get back in the day that really knew the wrestlers' names and where they were from. Before there was Google, before there was any of this, there were fans that knew all that because they cared. And uh, those fans I miss. Does that make sense? Not taking away anything from, from the new fans because the access is easier. But there was a special, there was a special thing that always stuck out in your mind with some of the fans, like back in the '90s, that knew everything, that that went out of their way to find a way to make a connection to you. I thought it was amazing when I would watch when I was a kid, and I would watch, and that was during that time. That that's just when wrestling and the internet started to blend, yeah. and and I would watch someone's debut as a surprise, and yet there's a guy in the crowd with a poster with that guy's name on it already. Yeah. Like how would he have known that? 
That was amazing, but at the same the time, dirt sheets. Yeah. Doggone it! <laughs> I didn't know what that don't was. Don't be as don't be as stooge. It was funny. Like when I first started a business, like the whole thing, the dirt sheets. Oh, you don't talk to the dirt sheets. You don't. Oh, that's stooging. That's bad for the business. You kill the business. And then all of a sudden, we get social media. It's like, isn't social media basically yeah. a glorified dirt sheet? Because you got a bunch of people that are telling you what you should do that have never laced up a pair of wrestling boots in their life. Hmm. Dirt sheets. But that's, anyway, you that's grew, just me being old and grumpy. But You know, you grew the beard so you could stroke it at that very moment. Oh, yes. That was <laughs> my evil. Mm, yeah, I didn't even think of that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So a couple more here. I really appreciate you no, joining I'm us. No, I'm having fun. I have looked across the industry, and I've looked across our, our multimedia industry, and there's been a huge rise in wrestling podcasting. Right. There's been a huge rise in, for instance, shows that are housed specifically on YouTube and platforms like that. And the most popular genre right now is let's go find a guy who's been through it all, let's put a microphone in front of him, <laughs> and let's just let him go. Whether yeah. it's Arn Anderson, whether it's Bruce Pitcher, whether it's Jeff Jarrett, let's just... Jerry Briscoe, let's, yeah. Let's get stories. And I'm addicted to it. I listen to all of them. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, for a guy who's very good on camera, very well spoken, and has a ton of stories, is that an area that you're ever going to get into? I don't know. Maybe at some point... Um, I'm still building stories and building adventures. Um, you know, I think everyone that's close to me, friends and family that's been around me long enough, if I start talking, they run. <laughs> you know, uh, Undertaker used to tease me. He said, no one can clear a table faster than I can as soon as I start talking. <laughs> like, it was like, oh, he's telling another story. And then, you know, next thing I'm sitting at the table with all my friends by myself. Uh, I don't know, maybe. Uh, it's funny. I, I've been asked several times about writing a book, and I'm, I'm conflicted about writing a book for for many reasons, like a lot of the stories and a lot of the experiences I had and so blessed to have been a part of, um, I don't know if I'm ready to share those, you know what I mean, to the general world so someone can just easily pick it up and read it on the yeah. phone. I would rather save those stories for, you know, if we're hanging out at the airport or something and you come up and you're a fan, I'll tell you a story about Andre or I'll tell you a story about, you know, Stone Cold or, or something like that. Um, I'm still, those stories are still special to me. So before I start mass producing them, uh, I think I'll hold on to a few of them. For That's that. really interesting because most people don't have that take. Most people accumulate stories and keep a diary so one day they can unload it in a book. Here yeah. you go. And you're actually a person who wants to hold on to them. I, I do because they're, they're, they're moments of, they're moments in time that I'll never get back that, that are just beautiful life lessons. Randy Savage, you know, um, one of the most iconic wrestling figures ever. When I was first hanging out with him and Hogan, uh, we'd go out to eat and I would, I would try to, to pay. Because, to, I mean, Hogan paid for everything. Like, paid for everything. Food, hotels, everything Hulk paid. And like, oh, hey, I'm making money now. I can carry my own weight. Like, I can, I can grab a dinner here. So I went to put my credit card out one time and Randy goes, no, 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 brother. Don't try to run with the Joneses. Let Hogan pay. <laughs> I was it. save your money. Let Hogan pay. You know, <laughs> this reminds me of so so. This reminds me of a story you've told many times. I've okay. probably heard you tell it a few times, but when they first put the belt on you, oh, the wearing the title. This is a beautiful story, and it's a story that I don't think a lot of maybe my audience has uh, heard, and, and it probably wouldn't make sense to them. So please lay out what happens the day after you win the title for the well, first time. My first match was against Hulk Hogan in Detroit, and I came out the WCW World Heavyweight Champion. My first match. So basically. Um, uh, I went from straight to the penthouse. Um, so when I won the championship, I'm talking to Hulkster after after the match. He says, now look, brother, when you go through the airport tomorrow, make sure you wear that championship so everyone knows that, you know, you've beaten Hulk Hogan and there's a new champion. And I'm like, okay. Like that's the norm. Like to me, like I don't know. Like the first time someone told me wrestler's honor, I thought it was like the most sacred thing ever. I didn't know wrestler's honor means like, ah, I'm going to stab you in the back. You know what I mean? But like, you know, like it's pathetic. But so I'm walking through the airport and I, in Detroit and I have the WCW World Heavyweight Championship title on and some of the other wrestlers that have seen me and, and I'm new. I mean, this is my first match. You're what I, age? I'm 23. So I'm a kid. I'm still amazed. Like, oh my gosh, the Steiners know who I am. Like, Ric Flair knows who I am. You know, they're all like, hey, champ, good job. But you're still seven foot tall in an airport. Where yeah, I'm still seven foot tall. Like, you know, like I'm a monster, but I'm still a fan in my mind. And I'm still so green and so gullible. And uh, I'm walking through the airport and, and 
Luger's like, hey, man, good job, <laughs> champ. So I take the title off. I put it on the x-ray belt to go through. I go through the x-ray, and I'm strapping it back on, and, and blonde-haired Sting comes over. The crew cut yeah. Sting with the razor shades, tan body, jacked to the gills, you know. He comes over, and he goes, what are you doing? I said, uh, uh, what, what do you mean? He goes, why are you wearing that? I said, well, 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 Hogan told me to wear it to let everybody know that there's a, there's a new champion. He goes, he's ribbing you. Take it off. Take it off. You look like an idiot. <laughs> and he walked off. But I was like, oh, they were playing a joke on me. Like, so it's like, uh, it, it was fun for a lot of the older guys to do that. When I was younger. it's like, you know, football, it's, it's kind of like hazing or paying your dues or, you know, that kind of thing. But it was one of the best ribs for me because I was so innocent I just wore this title proud as a peacock and now that I'm older I get the joke it's funny like, <laughs> this kid's so damn green he's still a fan you know what I mean he doesn't realize it's a business so there you go I just want to see it man I wish surveillance footage existed oh yeah well, I, you, I would just love it. so if Sting doesn't show up theoretically how long into that day I'd could have you wore have it all the way back to Tampa yeah. right there I'd have worn it on the plane like yeah, yeah I'm the new champ yeah here, here it is yeah I'm the champ like to me like I, I mean uh, I had one time where uh, Hogan, I, I didn't have anything growing up. I didn't, I didn't, I mean, my mom was a cop, my dad was a mechanic. So, you know, we were very humble people. And so I'm hanging out with Hogan and like, it's a whole nother world. Like Hogan made me understand, good or bad, that there was a lot of money to be made in wrestling, that this was a business, that opportunities there to become more successful than, than I had ever imagined, you know, which is, Contrary to what wrestling really is, wrestling really is is starving, wrestling 35, 40, 50 bucks a night, trying to get a break, trying to get on TV, trying to get a job, trying to establish a character. Like there, there are so many just incredible obstacles that talent has to go through to become successful. And here's my dumb, you know, 22 year old, seven foot, 390 pound, extremely athletic, strong, uh, you know, great white buffalo so to speak <laughs> comes along and of course I get introduced to you know Mercedes Benz and 15,000 square foot French Chateau mansions built in Clearwater and oh here's a Viper that's got holster on it oh here brother take the keys go drive the Viper so uh, just be careful you know that kind of thing so I'm driving a Viper and I'm sitting in this Viper that's red and yellow in Clearwater and I'm amazed because I mean my last car before I got into wrestling was a 76 Plymouth Valeri station wagon with four bullet holes and a bent <laughs> wheel. And when it went real slow, the whole car went like this. So now I'm in this Viper and all this power and the sun's out in Florida. And I remember the station wagon blows the horn, pulls up next to me because they see Hulkster all over it. So all these fans expect <laughs> to see Hulk Hogan. And they look over and here's me with my crazy hair and the giant. And I had just twisted Hogan's neck, I think, in a cage at a fall brawl or something like that. We'd started the angle. You know, and they were like, that on your mind, they could see that I have stolen Hulk Hogan's bike. I stole his car, too? I've stolen his car. Like, I am <laughs> I am the despicable human being. Like, it was so funny. But you know, Did those... you sell, though? Did you sell the car theft? No, no, no. I peeled out and took off. Are you yeah, kidding okay. me? I was 23 driving a 600-horsepower car. Yeah. Where do you think that? How do you think that went? It's clear water. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Skyway Bridge, 140. Here we go. You guys, um... I've always been fascinated by this. Too. I'm fascinated by the stuff I can't see on camera. Right. And I know that, I mean, this is an appearance-based business. It, it, back in the day, even more so than today, I would argue, everyone had a certain look that they wanted a guy to have, which requires you to be in the gym a whole heck of a lot. Yeah. And yet you're in another city every other day, too. Like, how, how hard is it? How much of a challenge is it not to get yourself motivated, just to go through the travel, get in a new city, find a gym, Find the directions over there. It's get to the arena. so much easier now. And then you, you'll talk about guys that, and there's a term in our business, some guys are called great wheel men, guys that, that are great behind the wheel. Like the best wheel guy that I ever rode with was Billy Gunn. He, without, before GPSs, because like when I stopped using buses and my travel slowed down a little bit, I would still have to drive, but they're bigger SUVs. And, but my way of doing things was I had a map. You know, I had a ruler and I would look at the map and plot out, you know, where I wanted to go. I would put the trip in my head by looking at a map and then follow the signs on the friggin' road. You know, that's that was my GPS. It actually happened once upon a time, yeah. Yeah, that's what we did. We didn't have a little thing and follow the, the blue line and turn it at the wrong place. So I remember Big Cass comes in the locker room one day 
and I'm sitting I've got my little ruler and I'm mapping out distance and figuring out how far I want to go. Now I've got an iPhone. Yeah. But I don't You don't trust it. I don't no, I want to see where I'm going. I want to see what towns are in between. Maybe I want to stop halfway. Oh, maybe there's that good diner halfway. I can stop close to that hotel that's around the corner that I can get that good breakfast and finish out because I I'm going through the roads. He comes in, he goes, hey, yo, what is that, an atlas? <laughs> like like I, I had broken out a, a sextant to navigate the stars. I'm like, yeah, that's how we used to do it back in the day. Like, you know, uh, I've matured since then now. So now I, I have, uh, I, I use the, the phone for, um, my atlas is retired, so to speak. So we got AEW Dynamite, AEW Rampage in Nashville here. Down at Municipal Auditorium. It's like two blocks away from where I live. It's wonderful. I can literally see it from the parking garage. If I were to ask you, if I were to give you the challenge of in one minute giving me the current state of AEW, where's the company right now? Where's it going? The company right now is doing fantastic. And that's not just a sales pitch. We're doing great. Uh, it's funny. I was just last week uh, working with our international team. Our international presence is growing. Um, our television uh Partnerships are super happy with the ratings that we're pulling down, so that's more more security for AEW that's going to be around for a lot longer time. Uh, there's a lot of positive things happening with the company with our community outreach programs that we're growing, and we've got an incredible influx of talent that is uh, really producing at a high level right now. And we've got some younger talent at um, some of our training facilities, basically like the Nightmare Factory in Atlanta and stuff like that that are coming along. We've got a couple of really, really potentially uh, tremendous athletes that are that are as tall as I am, if not taller. Hmm. So that's triple secret, what they call kayfabe information. But uh, I met a couple of these kids and they're big and they're athletic and uh, they have a lot of potential. Um, though my old boxing trainers say potential is a French word for you ain't worth a damn yet. But anyway, uh, it's there and I see the company doing well and we're continuing to grow. I mean, that's the thing that it's, it's hard when people try to compare AEW to WWE. No, it's a different product. It's more wrestling oriented and it's, it's not going to be as um, overproduced as, as the other part is because, you know, we're just getting our stuff together and, and defining our identity. But the one thing that we stay true Two is the talent and professional wrestling as a whole. So I like where we're going and what we're doing. And here's the thing, it's pro wrestling. A lot of things happen, a lot of things change uh, instantly. It's kind of like the weather, you know, here in Tennessee. If you don't like the weather, wait 10 minutes. You better believe it. <laughs> so, you know, wrestling is, is, is that way. You have to be fluid and you have to be current and roll with the times and that's, one thing I think AEW does a really good job of is being very fluid and still holding true to the course that we're pulling. I would really imagine, uh, to close it up here, I would really imagine the perspective of maybe someone on the WWE talent roster of AEW has got to be a lot different than the front office. Front office wants it squashed. Someone on the roster, the more options at the table, the better Yeah, for I mean, all the talent. Well, that's the thing, too. And there's a big difference. Like, I try to explain to people, like, you know, WWE is a family-owned empire built on sports entertainment. That's, that's where the bread and butter is done. AEW is owned by Tony Khan and his family who have created their empire elsewhere. So their focus isn't as corporate hardline focused as the other company is where a lot of sacrifices are made for you know quarterly budget cuts right. because they need to improve the dividends for the stock and stuff like that aew can put out a, an incredible product that's pro wrestling oriented and make money every year and roll on and guarantee jobs for for talent and an alternative place to work that's another thing too you've got a lot of amazing talent that doesn't quite fit you know you know a, a wwe mold that now is is getting opportunities and getting a chance to to make a connection with others and grow and then potentially maybe someday work at WWE too. I mean, you know, that's the thing. I mean, talent's gonna go back and forth. It's it's one of those kind of things where um, sometimes you have to leave to come back, you know? So I see a lot of talent in uh, in both companies that I, that I will see probably um, rotating back and forth with opportunity. And that's the thing, they have to keep it fresh, keep the fans excited and keep it going. Paul White, man, we appreciate you fitting us in today. Thanks, man. Appreciate it's been a pleasure. It. Hope for that long-winded BS talk, but there you go. Less of me, more of him. Oh, that's there's the a lot more of me, that's for sure. <laughs> we just got the same haircut. That's about it. <laughs>